Come here, Corinthians. Oops, my tag fell off. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, I got it. You like my little tags I got on my Bible. After I use them a while, they don't stay on there. 2 Corinthians, third chapter, starting the first verse. 2 Corinthians 3. Pages turning. Or apps opening. Stand with me, please. First verse. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we, like some people, need, do we need, like some people, letters of recommendations to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you're a letter from Christ and the result of our ministry, written not with ink but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of, the human, heart, of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves or claim anything for ourselves, but our confidence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you promised that you will give us life and life to the full. And I ask you, Lord, that you will just create in us a desire for your word, a desire for your spirit to work in our lives. And we thank you, Father, for how that even now, in, in the, I, I'm asking you, Lord, for a sovereign move of your Holy Spirit and that we can have uh, your heart in even this message today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I forget when I put this pepper in my mouth, I got to actually get rid of it. So anyway, I probably, in in my journey of life, I have found that I do not recognize enough, and I've been preaching these past few weeks on the sovereignty of God. <clears throat> God, and, and this is what one person wrote, and, in, and when, I, when I look at the sovereignty and the sovereignty issue, that is, God is always powerful. The questions come to us in how that power works in this world. He can, he can one word can fail this whole, can, I mean, it can create a whole new universe. And, and really, when he created in Genesis, one preacher said that, that word is still, we haven't found them yet because we don't have telescopes that can go far enough out, but there are probably other things that still being created because when God speaks, it creates. He creates out of chaos, and He spoke out of the chaos, out of darkness, and He created light. Out of nothing, He created something. And so you see, His word is that powerful. Now, the sovereignty issue of God, and this is where you can get into, and as we're good Cumberland Presbyterians, we're not full five-point Calvinists who believe that in God's sovereignty, He's ordered everything that really, you really have no choice in things. If you're really a good hyper-Calvinist, that your choices, and, and nobody really, they, they believe it on paper, but they don't really believe it. I hadn't met a true, true five-point Calvinist. I don't know, maybe Ollie has. I've, there's a few people that preach it, but I'm not sure if in their preaching they live it that way. But what I found, and the reason I say five-point Calvinist, is because they're very much so in believing everything is the sovereignty of God. It, if something good, something bad, something happens to you, it's all just God's will. I don't believe that. I believe there are some things that happen in this world because it has spun out of control with the fall of man. I believe there are some things that go on. Does it happen and catch God off guard? No, because in His sovereign power, He has already ordered and He's going to bring everything back into order. You can find that in Revelation where you'll see where all the kingdoms of our God and King are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior. All the kingdoms out here will bow their knee. Every tongue is going to confess. He's already said His sovereign power is going to bring that all back into play. The reason I say all that is because there's a lot of things that happen in our life and in my journey I have found that I have questions over the years. I've wondered why God hasn't done one thing or another. I've wondered why that, you know, I thought God's missed a few opportunities. If He really wanted to show out, show up and show out, then this is a few opportunities He missed. And even some of those things, if you're like me, you've prayed for and you've wondered, why has this not happened? It does not threaten God's sovereignty for us to question at times. Now, motive of heart is everything. My mom would always go back to the motive of my heart when I'd start questioning. You know, and I'd say, I want to go down Danny's. No. She never liked the question that came next. Why? Because out of my heart, it was always, you don't have the right to tell me that I can't go to Danny's. 
And she knew that. She could hear it in my heart. It wasn't that she was trying to deprive me of anything, that she just had a better plan for the day, and I just wanted to challenge that. It didn't last very long. Um, the hairbrush or the bolo paddle, I always took care of that. Whatever was at hand. We grew up in a different time. You, you all know what we're talking about that grew up my age younger. You, you understand that was uh, just the way you lived in life. I know that in the sovereignty issue, when you start looking at God's sovereign power, the way that His sovereign power interacts into this world, I believe, is very clearly through His Word. His Word is what empowers, it's an extension of who He is in this world. The reason why the enemy will try to keep you from His Word more, than, more occasions than not is because if you ever get that extension of His power, believing His Word in your heart... That's what it takes to get saved. You have to hear the Word of God, and then when you hear the Word, you have to respond to that Word, and that's how you get saved. How shall they be saved is what Romans said, unless someone preaches, unless someone speaks that Word. That's unless someone extends God's sovereign power to us. And this is where it makes us good common Presbyterians. We believe that you have a choice in that. You can choose to be eternally separated from God. And that's something I can't comprehend all the time that God would allow us to be separated from Him, that He could love us enough to let us choose to be separated from Him. I can't imagine that. My boys don't have that choice. At least I don't think right yet. I would chase them. I mean, that's what God does. He chases us down. He doesn't want us to make that choice. That's why He talks about in Deuteronomy that He puts before us all the choices of life and death, but He stacks the odds against us choosing death. He puts so much life around us, so much that we can enjoy, so much that we can have, and so many of His promises that are unfold. Even for the unbeliever, there's so many of God's promises that unfold. There are people that are unbelievers that can tap into some of the principles in the Word of God, and it works because God sets some things in principle in the world already in play. And you'll find that in and families that are givers, families that give out financially all the time, you know, they get even richer. You know why? They're tapping into the principle that God says, to whom much is given, much is required. But also if you give, it'll be given back to you. Press down, shaking together, running. You'll say, well, why is that important? Because God even blesses the heathen in order to draw them to himself. The reason I, I'm so fascinated with this sovereignty issue, because we live in a time where there's a lot of questions. You look right now and in Kenya where you have terrorists that have taken over a mall and shot so many people. And Kenya is a great Christian nation. I mean, they've got a strong Christian witness in Kenya. And that's why there's an attack, an all-out assault. I was thinking about this because this is something kind of Lord spoke to me as I was looking at that on the news. I hadn't really watched much news this week. And when I saw that go across in the Fox News update or whatever, every terrorist act should remind us of this, that we are just passing through, folks. I think any time we start getting a little comfortable and then you'll see it splashed all over the news, we're not to be settled here. And then whenever we start getting settled in thinking, well, I'm just going to try to live my days out unscathed so that I get to go be with Jesus when it's all said and done, that's not what God's after. He is after us being, and this is what he, Paul tells them in Corinthians here, He is after us being that letter that is being written to this world. In other words, He wants His Word his sovereignty flowing through us. You know what changes your life greater than anything else in the world? It's not just the obstacles you face. It's not the hard times, the good times, all those things. It is the Word of God being applied to your life. That's what transforms you. That's what the, the written Word being upon your heart. You'll find this, and this is what I have found, and this is what one person, uh, what we find in Scripture, this is what one person wrote. And I may have shared this with you before, but if you like me, I need to hear it three or four times. In God's nature, in His sovereignty, in His nature, it demands holiness. We see that revealed in His Word. But His character is very gracious that we can see in His Word because His character provides mercy. God's love, when we see in His Word, it actually has fulfilled the justice that was needed because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then God's heart delivered salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. His word was spoken in order to transform us. His word was spoken that created this world. His word was spoken even when we fell. His word spoke and said, I've got a solution that's coming and it's going to come of your seed. He's going to be my son. I've got a solution. 
All those who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. That is an extension of His sovereign power, even in the midst of a fallen world, even in the midst of a world that is full of chaos still. It's full of all kind of things that break loose all around you. Not just what we can see in Kenya, but even your life. Some of you came in here this week, and you're, I mean, your life has gone, and it's kind of exploded in your lap, and you're going, wow, where are you, God? The good news is God has not moved. His address has never changed. He's always been upon his throne with Jesus now sitting at the right hand, ever interceding for us. It's what the word says. That's why it's important that we know God's sovereignty by the extension of his word into our lives. By knowing that, that gives us the power, not just in the day to day, but gives us the overcoming power. Because when he speaks about us being overcomers in Christ Jesus, when he speaks about us being more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, what he is speaking to us about is his sovereignty is expressed through a life. Let me just give you this. His sovereignty is expressed through a life controlled, that means yielded to the Holy Spirit of God in the confines, meaning the protection of God's word. Now, let me just real quick. There are times that people will ask, why didn't God do this or that? I always take a couple of steps back and I start looking. Did my unbelief, now don't go condemnation way on me right here. Did my unbelief cause this? Unbelief is simply sin. That's all the Bible calls unbelief is sin. Did my unbelief in God's power somehow cause this? And that means this simple things. When he tells me to give and I'm going, no, I need that. That's unbelief. Because I don't believe God at his word and he promises that he can take care of me if I give. And then he prompts me with his spirit. And that's why I say the sovereignty of God should be expressed even as Paul saying, we are letters that are written by the hand of God for the world to read. And what they're looking for is someone that will express God's power through their lives by a life that's yielded to the spirit of God. And that's a lot kind of to roll around in your mind, you can maybe got to wake you up in the morning and not let that roll around in there because it's waking me up. And what I'm finding in Jeremiah 31, he talks about, he tells Israel, he said, I'm going I'm to put a whole new covenant. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put something, I'm going to unload something here on you. And I, and I love, he goes through, he says, it's not going to be a covenant made with the forefathers, which I took them by the hand, lead them out of Egypt. And this is Jeremiah 31. He says, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. At that time, declares the Lord, I'll put my law in their minds, right on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. That's what he is after, for us to be that handwritten word of God that's being spoken to this world. And you say, well, how does that work? Living by the life of the Spirit of God. When he talks about him pouring out his Spirit into us, and it says that anointing that's in us teaches us what? It teaches us about the power of God, about the change of our life and what God wants to do. We are to be written upon our hearts. Ezekiel also speaks to this in Ezekiel 36. And this is one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. And you'll find this in the midst of what was going on in Ezekiel. A lot of prophecies that are happening. And in Ezekiel 36, he tells us this. He says, for I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from the countries and bring you back to your own land. He's done that. Now, let me just a side issue. God said in his word, he said, even after you're scattered, Israel, I will bring you back. Now, you just go back in our history right now, just in our lifetime, some of our lifetimes, Israel was reestablished as a nation. It was really done almost overnight, comparatively. And then they started moving back in and they started flocking back in. You see, even in the Yom Yom Kippur Wars, what they call it, even when Egypt tried to go back in, it's like it was a defeat that was of a magnitude that you cannot imagine. Because God's sovereign word had already spoken. Now, take that to heart. You say, okay, that's good for Israel. What is he speaking to us today? What is he speaking to your family? What is he speaking to you as an individual? Has he spoken freedom to you, but you might not believe it? Well, you know what that becomes? That becomes unbelief. That becomes that falling short of whatever God is speaking to you. He wants to do that. That's why living a life by the Spirit means that we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to our hearts. 
Ezekiel 36, it goes on to say this. It says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. You will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities, from your idols. I will give you, and this is the 26th verse, this is the powerful verse. I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Wow. He's telling Israel this, but he's also telling us, he says, no longer will it be, I'm going to judge you whether you can keep these things that are written out here. I'm going to change you from the inside out where the want to changes. That's living by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of man is touched by the sovereign move of God through the Word of God. It rec- and it recreates in us a longing for His Word. That would be a born-again experience. That would be something that God is doing in each one of us. He's creating a longing. This is something that I know that I, I personally, I, years ago when they had that plane crash out here down there behind Arby's, there was a plane that was going to land at Bessemer. And, uh, and the lady was flying by herself. She's going to land at Bessemer. And for whatever reasons, the plane went down. And it went down right outside of that manufacturing place. It's right behind the Harley shop down there, out in the open field. I remember the story because they were looking. Everybody was looking frantically for that plane. And I think the guy, the husband, had created this beacon finder. And he was looking all over for her because he was looking at the flight path of where she came. And finally, I think he was the one that found her. It was on a cold night. If she had stayed there, she would have probably gone into hypothermia and stuff like that. But it was on a cold night. She lived through that. But I look at that and what God desires is that kind of, and let me use this word, that kind of desperation for Him. What He wants to create in us is a longing that would send a beacon. God, I cannot make it without you. If we understand of His sovereign power and how He wants to work in us, we would stop questioning, why didn't you do this, God? But we would get into His Word and we would see that He's already done a lot of promises here that we're just ignorant of those promises. And we do not apply them to our lives. And we go, well, why didn't you do this, God? But a lot of times people are asking the wrong question. We're asking, God, can you create in me? Can you write something new? Rewrite the program of my heart. Reprogram me, God. That's that born again, that, that transformation. Just as that fellow found his wife at night, they find that emergency beacon. Just, I think I remember saying he was riding around with it, just hanging out the window, just trying to find where his wife went down. You know, God desires us even more than that. He has already put in His Word a lot in place. He says, I have promised to bless you. I promise, and what we see in Ezekiel, He said, I'm going to give you a new spirit, give you a new heart that desires me. You remember what it was like before you got saved? Didn't really have a desire. I mean, you might have had a longing as a child. But then when you get older, the more sin gets in your life, the less longing you have. You don't wake up in the morning. I mean, I look at the children. That's why I said, don't forbid, forbid them not to come to me. Because you know what? That they're the ones. If you watch them, there's an innocent longing that's in their heart. Let me ask you this. Do you have that innocent longing in your heart for God? Or is it a chore? Somebody, even me talking about reading the word, is it a chore? And when I talk about praying, is it a chore? We're talking about a relationship with the sovereign God who wants to write in our hearts his message so the world may read it. And it's like when Paul was saying in the church in Corinthians, he said, look, it's not that we're going to make ourselves to be competent before you. No, we're not competent at all in ourselves. We don't claim anything, but our competency comes from God. In other words, he is the one that made us the competent ministers that we are because he has written something on our hearts. He's put a longing in us. A lot of times we don't know what we have until we truly have lost it. Many of y'all have ever backslidden? I have. Yeah. You remember what it was like when you woke up one day, just like the prodigal. And you woke up one day and you said, wow, I've lost it. I mean, that's a sovereign move of God moving through his word. He promises his mercies are new every day. That's an extension of his sovereignty. I will give you new mercies. All he's asking for us to do is to respond to that mercy, that grace that he gives us each day. That's all he's asking us to do. He recreates in us. I love the story of the parable of the lost son, which is the prodigal. The story of when he's in the pig pen at his worst point, at his lowest place, 
knowing he didn't belong. But let me, hear, let me just share this with you. Even though his dad gave his portion to the prodigal son, it did not diminish his dad's power in any way. Even though we may waste what the grace and mercy God has given us as a child and walk away from it, it does not minimize God's sovereignty, His mercy, His grace, His extension of who He is. It doesn't change who He is. Because your life is gone to pieces, it does not change who God is and how He works within our life. All He's waiting for us, for us to respond to Him, to be that, that child of God He's calling us to be. And if we get to that place, if we respond to His Word, then we'll find that His Spirit will start moving even more. Because that's the prodigal son. He's, he's sitting in the pig pen and he said, Look, I'm as far away as I've ever been. But here's the sovereignty of God. Even in the pig pen, God can reach. Even at our lowest point, and understand, it wasn't some preacher or traveling evangelist coming down the street that saw him standing there in a pig pen. No, it was God moving on this man's heart, moving on this young man's heart. And he started thinking, wow, I mean, the hired servants eat better. Even the, the, the people, the, the animals eat better than I'm eating now. I mean, it was the sovereignty of God moving in that situation because he remembered the goodness of God. He remembered the goodness of his father. And he said, I'll just go back and throw myself at my dad's feet and just beg for mercy. Well, you know what? God's sovereignty, he's already promised us mercy. All he's asking us to do is to respond to his word. That's all he asks anyone to does it make cheap mercy, cheap grace? No, mercy is never cheap. It was bought with a great price. And we should never, never, ever, ever cheapen grace because grace is the empowerment after we've tasted mercy. I can distinguish the two. I never go with cheap grace. Grace is not a forgiveness and a carte blanche when we've been out here in sin. Da, 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 da. His mercy cleanses us. It cleans us up. His mercy is the only way. There's no way we can work our way back in. His word said as we repent, He is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just. That's His word. That's who He is. It's not threatened by what we do, how much we goof up. He is not threatened. His power is not threatened by that. Or whether we respond or not, His power is not threatened at all. But when the prodigal came to himself and he decided to go home, when he was still a long way off, mercy came running. powerful that's the move of God God always moves along the line of his word if you feel like God's missing in your life today if there's something that's off in your life if your relationship with Jesus Christ get back to his word you know one word it never goes never grows old repent it never grows old you think well I'm not a bad a sinner as somebody else no, you're not. I can pick out, you guys are saints compared to some of the people I used to hang around. But what I have found is that God is always looking for us not to keep us in status quo, to, to bring us more to Him. Mercy comes running. No matter where we are, what stage of life. No matter how much we may question, God, why didn't you come through at this point in my life? I, and, and a lot of times we end up on that dirt road, on a dead end somewhere, wondering where God is, throwing our fist up and saying, God, why didn't you come through? And there were several turns back there and there were signs along the way. Don't go here. And we call it, we, we were threatening God. But if you look back on your life, anytime you've made a wrong turn, you can usually, if you look in your rearview mirror of your life, you can see that sign back there, can't you? Anytime you've run off the road, proverbial in your life, and you're sitting in a ditch somewhere, and if you've ever done that, I have, and you look back and you see that sign, and if you can just kind of back up and look at it, and it's got one of those little squiggly signs that said there's a curve ahead, then you realize, okay, God, because what happens is we end up in our own muck, in our own mire, and then we come up out of that ditch and we're saying, God, why did you do this to me? No. Understand this. God is powerful. He has set 
benchmarks, signs, things along the way. And he doesn't want any of us to crash. He doesn't want any of us to be away from him. He wishes, according to his word, for no one to perish, but for all to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's who he is. That's his sovereignty. That's his power. Extended through his word. Here's how we know whether we're walking in his word or not. One of the things that I'm not going to get into a lot of them because I just going to want you to hear. It's like a, I love grapes. It's one of my favorite fruit. And I love getting them when they're just, and I'll confess to you, before I even buy them, I'll get one off the cluster and eat it. And if they need to weigh me on the way out, that's fine. But I want to make sure I've got the good ones. You know what I mean? Instead of getting home and having those bitter ones. He's got a cluster of what's called the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. If we're walking and believing Him that He is sovereign, He is changing us, putting His laws on our heart. He is making us a new heart. He is putting us something fresh in us. If that freshness is in us, then what you see is in Galatians 5.22, it says the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, the cluster that is being exemplified, what is being written on our lives is this cluster of fruit that you can see. And it starts with love. Now, I'll tell you something, folks. You go back and just read that in the, in the light of that God is writing a newness in our heart. If we're walking according to being controlled by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is teaching us according to anointing in 1 John. It's teaching us God's Word. It's putting it in us. If somebody comes up to you and says, well, God told me to do this, and if it ever goes contrary to this, no, He didn't. I can tell you right now, He did not. And I've told people that before. They're going, God's told me I need to do this. I need to hate this person. I'm like, no, you can't. That's not God's power. He's not going to bless that. He will never bless that. You know, you can hate sin all day long, but don't put a picture of your aunt on it. What God desires is for us to have the cluster of His character displayed in us by a life of the Spirit of control of the Spirit of God. A life that's yielded to Him. So we see that love. We see the joy. We see the peace. We see the patience. He did not say, understand this, this is where the question of God's sovereignty comes in. He didn't say a peaceful life means that you're not ever going to have conflict. He didn't say that. He didn't say you're going to have patience because your life is going to be like that, that, that ocean in the morning, just smooth and not a wave in it. There you go, baby. That's, and that's what we run into. We question God's power when we start getting a little ripples and the waves going in our life. And we start going, God, why aren't you doing it? He said, I'm going to write my word on your heart and it's going to be displayed. And it's going to be the cluster of this fruit of the spirit that's going to come out. That when turmoil happens, peace is going to break out. That when the waves start happening, when things are not right, he said, I'm going to give you my patience because I want people to read that. Not to read your search situation and circumstance. If we ever get our eyes off of Jesus, then we start looking at our situations and circumstances and we're going, God, why didn't you show up? Why didn't you come through for me? And God's saying, I did come through for you. I have promised you love when you're in a hateful situation. I have promised you joy when there ain't no hope. I have promised you peace when all turmoil is breaking out. I have given you patience when everybody is getting on your last nerve. I've given you kindness when people are rude. I have given you goodness because I'm displaying who I am. I have given you my faithfulness even when you're unfaithful. And I am putting in you that, that power of self-control in your life. And you look at all that and you're going, this is the promise of God. That's the fruit, the cluster, the fruit of God that's working in our lives. That is what's being written on our hearts and that people can read. But I'm going to ask you this. I'm not going to ask you how far away from God you are or even how close you are. What I'm going to ask you is what's people reading this week on your heart? What have they read? You're being a, you're handwritten by the, the Spirit of God. What have they read? It's, gosh, folks, I'll tell you. If it was hard... You might as well open the trap door to hell. I'd be sliding all the way down. I make it a lot harder than it is. The easy part comes that God's sovereign word and His sovereign power is extended to us. And then He has given us the power of His Holy Spirit to enact 
that that's sitting dormant a lot of times in us that can bring it to life and write it upon our hearts. And then people will look at it and going, you know what? That person I saw, I watched them go through. I mean, they went through some tough times, but I looked at them and I said, if I could have that kind of patience, then their God's believable. Or everybody hates that person. But look at them, how they love him. I don't get it. Why is that important? Because Paul said that, you're, God, you're writing on us your letter. It's not a letter that kills. It's not the do's and don'ts. It's just it's actually a letter of life to this world to see that what we have is true life. Not how close or how far away from God. It's, it's more or less... If you let God's hand of the Holy Spirit write on your heart today. You had a tough week? I'm sorry. Sometimes it didn't really. God's put a lot of things to keep you from having a tough week, but you chose to keep driving. It's the way I've always done it. And God's like, turn around, turn around. Repent. They hate me, so I hate them. They hurt me. Bitter, bitter, bitter. Curve ahead. God's sovereign power has put up every obstacle in our way for us to choose life. He wants to write on our hearts life. Here's what I ask you, and then we close out. See if you come on. Y'all band, come on. We're just going to sing Open the Eyes of My Heart. We're going to do it softly, gently, but. I'm not asking you to come down. or, But here's what I will offer. That I believe the Spirit of the Lord is offering to us today. You may have questions I can't answer necessarily, but I can point you that God has His Word. He's got His Spirit. But what I want you to know is that God does have an answer for every situation we're going through. We may not even get it just today, but if we seek Him, the Bible says, an extension of His Word, ask shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. Why is it important in a congregation setting like this? It is not, honestly, I'll be honest with you, I can walk, we can say amen, walk out here and go have prayer. I mean, go have prayer and eat. It's not about my ego. I promise you that. Sometimes it is about our pride. Because we want to do it our way. And we want God to meet us where we are when he invites us to meet him where he is there's nothing there is something powerful I think about this area I do it's a place where a lot of people have met God a lot of people some of you came in here today and you're going man I, I don't know if God's powerful enough come meet him this area right up here come meet him I don't have to pray with you nobody has to pray with you you can come meet God